The year has rolled over to 2020, and what a decade it's been. I went from my first year of junior high school to my third year of university. Games have always been something important to me. They're a unique way to express a story, build the world around you with thought out use of music, or just to be an escape for players in a completely different experience than real life. Games have always been my biggest hobby, and I've been streaming now for the past two years. Now that it's 2020, I want to discuss the games that have influenced me the most and impacted me the most over the past 10 years. Instead of just going through my favorite games that were released within the last 10 years, I like to mention my favorite games from every year, 2010 until 2019, mentioning my game of the year for every year, with a maximum of two honorable mentions. Then at the end, I'll discuss my favorite games from the decade as a whole. What year I categorize each game into is its North America launch year, rather than its initial release year if those two are different. If you're new to the channel, keep in mind I'm a mostly Nintendo gamer, and if your game isn't on the list, just assume I haven't played it, as it's probably the truth. Everything stated in this video is my opinion, and you're entitled to your own opinion. Just kidding, every other opinion is wrong. Starting things out at 2010, I started my first year of junior high school this year, which meant a lot of friends I was around in elementary weren't around anymore. Up to this point I typically enjoyed playing Pokemon the most, and would play Pokemon Diamond and Pearl with my friends after school. At home I'd be playing the Wii, and during recess a friend and I would be talking about our progress in Super Mario Galaxy, how many stars we had, which comments we'd completed, and so on. This leads us into the first game that impacted me in 2010, Super Mario Galaxy 2. I had such a blast with the first game, with it becoming the first game I ever 100%ed. I wasn't as motivated anymore for Galaxy 2, my friend from the playground I had never even seen again after that, but Galaxy 2 still captured what made me love the original Galaxy. I had thought I 100%ed it as well, but after checking if I had about 4 years ago, I found there were just a handful of galaxies left, and I finished what I had started all those years ago at 100%ed Galaxy 2. My game of the year for 2010 has to go to Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. My first ever main series Pokemon games were Diamond and Pearl, I had never been exposed to any region other than Sinnoh. Heart Gold and Soul Silver had me fall in love with Johto, and having two regions to explore made for an adventure that went on and on. Even in the post game, I remember finding out more bit by bit about what else to do, such as catching legendaries or defeating Red. I remember for long car rides I'd pull out the DS and grind some more in the Pokeathlon or collect apricots and make special Pokeballs. Though I couldn't truly appreciate the soundtrack until many years later, the soundtrack has become nostalgic to me. These games also had the Poke Walker, the original Pokemon Go, which you'd put a Pokemon into and go on walks with, which I did whenever I could. I still have my Poke Walker to this day, even if it collects dust on the shelf. I fondly remember this as one of the first games that took me on an adventure that felt like it would never end. I'd open up the console and see what the world had for me today. 2011 up to this point, I had played lots of Pokemon, lots of Mario, but not a lot else apart from when I was very young. I had been recommended a series called The Legend of Zelda for a long time, which as a child I saw as something for older kids, and I figured at this point I was an older kid too, or something. <laughs> it looked like a more mature experience than what I was used to, is what I'm trying to say, so I was looking forward to trying out my first one. I entered the Zelda universe with The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. This was one of the first home console games I had played with an emphasis on telling an engaging story, and it pulled me in. I genuinely wanted to know how Link's story unfolded, and at the time, it felt like I was opening a deep novel. Of course, it wouldn't feel like that nowadays, having experienced much deeper stories and JRPGs more akin to novels, making Skyward Sword's plot seem pretty simple in comparison, but the depth I felt back then was real. It remains my favorite Zelda game to this day, and still has my favorite story in a Zelda game. It developed a real connection between Zelda and Link, wanting me to see right by them both. Its soundtrack moved me and made me feel the emotions the characters felt in a way very few games I had played before had managed to achieve. Many people disliked the motion controls, but it felt smooth to me with the Wii Motion Plus, and it made the experience real. I became Link. I was doing real sword fights with my enemies, not just pressing buttons to see what happens on screen. I got to be part of the adventure, and it blew me away. Just. Never play this with a Cabela's Wiimote rifle. Yeah, what? Oh, I need a drink break, excuse me. Uh, take a 
Skyward Sword! Woo! Skyward Sword is so close to being my game of the year for 2011, but that spot has to go to Pokemon Black and White. On the surface, it's a Pokemon game like any other. You're a trainer who goes around collecting gym badges, stopping a group of baddies, and becoming the new champion of the region. This game does that as well, and casually playing through without taking the time to admire the story built around this game can make it seem like that's all there is. Your character in main series Pokemon games never goes through any character development. That's become the standard in main series Pokemon, your trainer is up to your interpretation. Because of this, this game took the path of developing another character, Enharmonia, somebody you could say I borrowed a name from. N has a somewhat dark past, being abandoned as a child and left to be raised by Pokemon, until being found by Getsis, aiming to only show him the bad cases between Pokemon and people, showing N countless acts of violence and portraying humans to be terrible beings, while never showing any of the positive cases, forming N into a radical leader for Getsis to use as a puppet figurehead. With the mindset that humans are evil and aim to exploit Pokemon, N sets out into the world, and through your trainer and others, begins to gradually see the light side of things as well, come to realize that the world is not just black and white. I would argue that N is the main character of black and white, and is developed in such a unique way that seemed like a main series Pokemon game would never take. Overall, it's an incredible experience, and remains my favorite main series Pokemon story to this day, and thus, Pokemon Black and White is my game of the year for 2011. Starting things off for 2012, we have Assassin's Creed 3, which was my first entry to the series, I'm sorry to say. Sure, there were plenty of problems with this game. I'd get lost, I didn't know fast travel was a thing because I was an idiot, and some of the missions were stupidly hard, some were stupidly easy, and screw that Charles Lee chase. The combat was incredibly easy, but I didn't care because I had a lot of fun doing it regardless, even if it wasn't challenging. The plot gets a bit fuzzy, and the cliffhanger certainly didn't do me any wonders, though. At the end of the day, its world drew me in. It made me feel awesome, whether exploring around, jumping off a rooftop, or just in combat, as I had never played an Assassin's Creed game before. Being able to look at music in a new light all these years later, Assassin's Creed 3 had some serious jammers in that soundtrack. It may be far from perfect, but AC3 will always hold a special place in my heart. Pokemon Conquest was an awesome concept. I love tactically planning out my in-game months, and moving my favorite Pokemon across the battlefield in a Fire Emblem type style of combat. Don't at me, I know it's based off Nobunaga's Conquest gameplay. I was somebody crazy enough to 100% it, which wasn't actually worth doing, especially towards the end. But before then, it was an absolute joy to develop my Pokemon and Warlords, and also has some serious jammers in that soundtrack. Game of the Year 2012 for me has to go to Xenoblade Chronicles. I may not have played it in 2012 due to the limited copies and attempts to advertise, so I didn't know it existed until Shulk got announced for Smash, and only got to experience his story for the first time on the 3DS. Since then though, I've played through the 70 hour JRPG three times, which will soon become four this year with the definitive edition release. Xenoblade Chronicles is one of the most incredible stories I've ever experienced in any medium, whether it be game, movie, or book. I have read some awesome books. Man, was the inheritance cycle ever good. It's a story that challenges the typical conventions of storytelling, with notions we as viewers of the story typically are used to simply accepting. It has a villain so brilliantly written, one of the best villains I've ever seen, who's so convinced he's in the right and is doing justice through his deeds. The story does an incredible job at making no characters who are truly evil, save for those who exist purely for that purpose. The way Shulk develops as a character is absolutely brilliant. While many heroes may start out their journeys in pursuit of some form of justice or to achieve something for themselves or others, Shulk sets out in revenge, pure and simple, seeking the heads of those who wronged him. He becomes outright bloodthirsty, something you don't often see in protagonists. Talk all you want, because those words will be your last! This is later used to elevate the plot, but as it goes on, Shulk gradually begins to learn to see himself in others, and starts wanting to take the path to avoid becoming a villain himself. With the power to see into the future, he is able to know what's to come, and attempt to save himself and his friends. Sometimes successfully, sometimes not, and he needs to learn how to deal with the results of his actions. The story builds up to a brilliantly done plot twist, which feels natural as it is gradually hinted at throughout the entire story. The soundtrack is absolutely breathtaking, 
and will have you feel just how determined the characters are, to the sadness they feel, to even go so far as to never want to make you leave the title screen. Xenoblade Chronicles I gladly give my Game of the Year for 2012 to, as a musical masterpiece that tells one of the greatest stories I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing. 2013. Now, this may feel a bit out of place, but I really, really enjoyed LEGO City Undercover. If I was rating Game of the Decade for its comedy, this would be number one. All of its non-stop jokes are so incredibly stupid, and the game is very self-aware of how stupid its jokes are. They're jokes that are so stupid that they're hilarious to me, and I had such a blast playing this game. This to me is the definition of a feel-good game, making one of the most enjoyable experiences of the year to me. I'd easily recommend this game to anyone who just wants to sit down and have a good time through laughter. It started as a Wii U exclusive, but released on more consoles a few years ago, and supports cooperative play, allowing me to sit down with a friend and just enjoy a simple game among laughter. And now, he wanted to see me. His ice cream parlor was a gathering place for local hoodlums. There was Tony one time. So called because he said everything once. Hey! Polly blindfolds. No, tell him I can't see him today. Lucky Pete. Good to see ya! Whoa! No! Hey! I found the penny! Fire Emblem Awakening is an incredible game, and one of the first 3DS games I found myself dumping countless amounts of time into. It may not have been my first Fire Emblem game I played, though I know it was for a lot of people, as it was the game that brought back the Fire Emblem series from disaster. The story was intriguing and engaging, and a very enjoyable tale overall, but could have been done a bit better in the way it was structured. The subplots felt a bit disconnected from each other. The soundtrack was truly awesome, being incredibly epic at times, or truly saddening at others. This was a very enjoyable casual game, watching all the characters grow together, both support-wise and as units, and was the perfect game to lie in bed to watch story play out, do some casual maps, or even dance for 200 turns straight. Yeah, I did that. This is the game that turned me into a crazy Fire Emblem nerd, who went on to make Excel spreadsheets playing out optimal builds for every game that followed. Lunatic Plus Classic, the hardest difficulty, which I've beaten before, soon to be twice, is definitely way imbalanced though. I shouldn't have to reset a tutorial level for weeks on end because only two or three units don't get one-shotted. Without Lunatic Plus Classic though, playing through the game just casually, it's an unbelievably enjoyable time, and one of the standout games of the 3DS. My personal game of the year for 2014 though has to go to Assassin's Creed 4. After experiencing my first Assassin's Creed game the previous year, I became insanely hyped for the new title, and I was not let down. The story was intriguing, but not too crazy. The music was jamming at times, but also not super crazy overall. But let me tell you, those jammers, they were jammers. This game stood out to me with its gameplay and its world. Ship combat was very well polished. It was like an enjoyable gaming pastime of my childhood, going around plundering ships in Sly Cooper 3. It was fun to just go around battling ships until pirate hunters came after you and you see how long you could fend them off. The lack of loading screens while exploring around the world just added to how real the world felt. If you see an island you want to explore, just sail on over, set anchor, swim over, and do some exploring. This was the first open world game I played that I wanted 100%, and I wanted to explore everything, I wanted to collect everything, I wanted to battle every boss ship the game could throw at me. The regular combat works the same as Assassin's Creed 3 which was still incredibly easy, but I didn't care because I felt awesome doing it, and some of the animations were just such eye candy. This remains as my favorite Assassin's Creed game to date, as the following title shook the foundations of how I viewed the franchise a bit, and I never got the time to properly hop into titles that followed this. When I think of Assassin's Creed, this is the game I think of. I used to play this game in handheld mode on my Wii U while lying in bed, the Wii U console plugged in at my bedside. I'd stay up late just sailing around and collecting more, exploring more, and coming ever closer to the beautiful number of 100%. Later came Assassin's Creed Rogue, which ran off the same engine and had gameplay near identical to Assassin's Creed 4, but with some improvements. I was disappointed it didn't come to the Wii U, likely due to the poor sales of Assassin's Creed on Nintendo consoles. I only picked it up over a year after it came out, buying it on Steam, where I'd play it on my laptop and connect my Xbox 360 controller to it, 
playing it in bed and just reliving the good times I had doing the same in Assassin's Creed 4 years before. Just last year, Ubisoft released Assassin's Creed 4 and Rogue on the Switch together as the Rebel Collection, and I really really wanted to play it, but I haven't gotten the chance because things get really busy as a university student, plus streamer slash content creator with a GameCube that lasts a year. Anybody with a Switch who's not yet experienced Assassin's Creed 4 or Rogue, I would highly recommend this game to. It's such an enjoyable experience in its vast world. 2014 a title that stood out to me in 2014 was Watch Dogs. By this point, the standard I had in my head for Ubisoft games was a story that tried but kinda of flopped in the end, music that's fitting enough, not too crazy, maybe some jammers here or there, but wow, what awesomely fun and smooth gameplay, and so much to go out and do in the world, most satisfying games to 100%. I got this game for free with my motherboard when I built my first computer, for whatever reason, Similar to Assassin's Creed Rogue, I'd play this on my laptop in bed with an Xbox controller, having fun exploring the world and doing everything I possibly could. Hacking stuff was so cool, and made every encounter or chase feel like a puzzle that I had to use both tactics and skill to solve. While I may not have been as impressed by Watch Dogs 2 later, Watch Dogs left a lasting impression of fun on me, if that makes sense. I think of it, and I think of driving around late at night and relaxing with the game. Or driving in game, that is. I don't think I was old enough to drive for real back then. <laughs> I was on the fence about picking up Hyrule Warriors, but wow, what a content-packed game. The story was kinda meh, but the music was so friggin' awesome. As well, the gameplay was so satisfying when you got the hang of it and knew how to properly dash cancel, making it so that you rarely ever have to use the block button again, and instead time your dashes to avoid all enemy attacks, which I learned the patterns of, and man is this game ever packed with content. Without even any of the DLC, it took me a couple hundred hours to 100% the game, most of which was on the adventure map. The DLC then added more adventure maps with each DLC, which I never got too far into because it was just so much content. The Switch version has everything of the original, plus all the DLC from the Wii U and 3DS, meaning 8 more adventure maps on top of the first one, and designed in such a way that your levels should be about right if you go from map to map in order. For anyone looking for the most bang for their buck in a Switch game, this is always the first game I recommend. If you don't think you'll get bored of the gameplay, expect this game to be able to keep you busy for a couple of years. Despite the amount of fun I had with the last two mentioned game, my game of the year for 2014 has to go to... Bravely Default. I often express my on-the-fence opinion about this game, what with the second half of the story dragging on and having to fight the main four bosses of the game five times each to get the true ending. Despite that though, I've had one of the most enjoyable experiences with this game on the 3DS. I would stay up late into the nights, watching the cutscenes play out and just soaking in the story. I would experience this incredibly long story bit by bit every night as it went by, and honestly I would argue it's one of the best JRPGs on the 3DS. The soundtrack wasn't perfect perfect, but it was still pretty spectacular and very memorable. The gameplay was so unique, and allowed you to have gameplay in your own unique way. I'll always think of lying in bed with my 3DS and enjoying the story whenever I think about this game. 2015. One of the most standout games of the Wii U's history was Xenoblade Chronicles X. It may not have had as much of a focus on story as Xenoblade Chronicles before it, but it went above and beyond for its world. There is always more to do, and always more to explore. This is one of two games I've ever played where, when I wasn't playing, it felt like the world was calling out to me in a way, promising more adventure to be had, the other being Breath of the Wild. The scale of this world and amount of stuff to do is just so much to take in, keeping me occupied for easily several hundred hours. This game challenged what open world meant to me. One of the main features of this game are skills, mechs that you and your party can ride around in. You only unlock them halfway through the story though, and only unlock the ability to fly with them three-fourths through the story, meaning you've gone by foot through most of the game at this point, which lets you truly appreciate just how much easier they make your life and appreciate how much bigger the world suddenly becomes. The music adds so much to the world around you. Combined with the world, it amounts to what I would argue is the most stunning game on the Wii U. In addition, the music hits everything it needs to to make you feel incredible when it needs to. 
I would argue this is a must play for fans of open world games. I remember playing this game before it took off to become the behemoth that it did. Undertale was just so beautifully unique, challenging the conventions of turn-based RPGs and the conventions of games in general when it came to concepts such as saving or having multiple playthroughs. By far my favorite part of this game is the music, having such a brilliantly crafted soundtrack that many of the remixers I'm a fan of continue to remix this game to this day. It has some of the most brilliant cases of reusing tunes in any game I've seen. Having the same tunes played in different ways expresses the feeling that this is similar, but very different when it needs to. This game is an absolute pleasure to play, when not playing with other mitts that is. Both Xenoblade Chronicles X and Undertale are strong contenders for my game of the year for 2015 in my books, but that prestige has to go to... Pokemon Super Mystery Dungeon. After the semi-disaster that was Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Gates to Infinity, getting the most mixed feelings from the fanbase, it seemed like Pokemon Mystery Dungeon may not be able to make a comeback, or recapture that essence of what made Pokemon Mystery Dungeon explorers of time, darkness, and sky just so incredible. Lo and behold, they did it, and breathed new light into Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. Previous Mystery Dungeon games have focused on the player as the protagonist, with the partner being the lead supporting character. For Super Mystery Dungeon, however, such an emphasis is played on the story and development of the partner, to the point that I would argue that the partner is the protagonist of Super Mystery Dungeon, and the player is the lead supporting character. Many people complain that the game had a slow start, and that the real story doesn't pick up until later. I, however, feel this was integral to the plot. By having so much of the game go before the main plot starts, it builds up the most believable relationship between the player and the partner in the Mystery Dungeon series. Mystery Dungeon 1 was like, hey, I just met you, have this spare house I happen to have. Mystery Dungeon 2 threw you together and you had to go with your partner as you had nowhere else to go. Super Mystery Dungeon, however, your partner isn't even the first Pokemon you meet, far from it. You gradually become childhood friends, and are even walking to and from school together. Your relationship has its ups and downs, and you have several adventures together before you're even thrown into the main plot, which most of you are simply called out as being a boring slow start. Super Mystery Dungeon develops a relationship between the two main characters to a level never before done in the series, and it's brilliant. The main plot, similar to Mystery Dungeon 2, becomes very dark, and very surprising that it can get that dark in a Pokemon game. It has mature themes, and tells a unique story where no character is truly, truly evil, and everyone has their chance at redemption, and teaches that it's only through acceptance first that change is able to take place. The soundtrack of this game is the best in the series, very surprising considering how good the Explorer's soundtrack was. The main themes of these two games I consider fairly equal, but Super Mystery Dungeon had the best overall soundtrack. Every single dungeon I entered made me want to bust out my guitar and start playing along because it was such a jammer, and is one of the best soundtracks as a whole I've ever had the pleasure of hearing. Gameplay has been fine-tuned and refined, fixing almost every problem I had with Mystery Dungeon games up to this point, making for an incredibly enjoyable experience. This is one of my favorite games ever made, with a story that makes me genuinely feel like my life is better off for having gotten the chance to experience it. 2016. Anyone who's been by the channel for a while knows I play a lot of Dead by Daylight. This game has gone through a lot of changes since it first came out, and it's been cool to see how it evolves. It has plenty of problems with it, always have, always will, but at the end of the day, it's a fun game to hop into for sessions here and there, and is an absolute blast to play with friends. At the end of it all, I genuinely believe that the developers have done a pretty good job so far. Rollercoaster Tycoon was one of my main two childhood franchises, the other being Sly Cooper, Pokemon only came a bit later. RCT and Sly were the things I was playing when I first discovered what video games even were. I got my first RCT game, the first title in the series which released in 1999, from a cereal box. Anybody else remember computer games packaged in cereal boxes? RCT was easily the game slash franchise that I played the most on PC, possibly having the most hours out of all the PC games I've played even to this day, probably even more than Dead by Daylight if I had to guess, which I have roughly 1200 hours in. Because of how much I enjoyed the first game, I later picked up RCT 2, which had already been out for a while before I even started RCT 1. I fell in love with this game as well, and spent so much time playing it on my desktop or old Toshiba laptop. Did they even still make laptops? Later came RCT3, which felt so futuristic because it was a computer game that was in 3D. 
Again, many, many hundreds of hours dumped into this. Then the series kind of died. Until its great comeback over a decade later. That's right, Roller Coaster Tycoon World. Or at least it would be if I was making a list of the worst games of the decade. No, I'm talking about the gem that is Planet Coaster, the game actually made by the people who made RCT3. The gameplay feels like this is what playing an RCT with free movement not restricted by a grid should feel like. The tools are easy to use and it's so satisfying to fill a park with scenery in such a way that I never had the experience to do in previous RCT games. The visuals ooze charm, bringing a cartoony art style that reminds me of RCT3, but is just so much more charming. The world feels alive and vibrant. Unfortunately, not every park was created equal, and I had to give up on my original goal of 100%ing the game when it first released. The soundtrack is where the game really stands out to me though. When I first heard Yumi and Gravity before the game released, my eyes honestly got watery I was so taken aback. It shows just how much heart and soul was poured into this game that's about making an amusement park. I know Planet Zoo just released late last year, and I haven't gotten the chance to try it out yet, but I would very much like to. Planet Coaster holds such a special place in my heart, but my game of the year for 2016 has to go to Bravely Second. I wasn't planning on picking up this game originally, due to the mixed feelings I had about the latter half of the story of Bravely Default, but was eventually convinced to pick it up only to find it had none of the problems I had with the story of Default. This game challenges the conventions of what it means to be a game through its storytelling, telling a story that can only be told through a game, similar to Undertale. It's such a brilliantly unique story that factors in the fact that it's a game, making for an incredibly unique experience. The soundtrack is incredible, and though many judge it as not as good as Default, I quite enjoy the new tune Second had to offer. Bravely Second brought about many new jobs, along with plenty more ways to break the game in fun and wacky ways, getting to tailor your gameplay to your own style. Overall, this is one of my favorite games of the 3DS's history. Blowing me away in so many ways, this game easily gets my game of the year for 2016. And let me tell you, I can't wait for Bravely Default 2. 2017 I may not be much of an indie gamer, but Rakuen is a game that caught my attention after I heard it had been developed by the person responsible for the soundtrack of Plants vs. Zombies, Laura Shigihara. I picked up this game on release, expecting a quality soundtrack, but not sure what else. The game may not have had much gameplay, usually amounting to walking around, getting people things, or some minor puzzle solving, but the focus wasn't on the gameplay. In the hospital, using both the real world and the world of Morizora's forest, you learn the backstories of your fellow hospital patients and help bring them some closure to their stories. I would play this game late at night, experiencing a new story by a new patient every night. By the end, the finale had me shedding some tears. The soundtrack was spectacular, some of the most beautiful music I've had the pleasure of listening to. It's not a long game, roughly 6-7 to seven hours, and is something I highly recommend. I did know what to expect from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. The first trailer that released for it threw me off and made me think it would be a pretty meh game, never even coming close to the masterpiece that was Xenoblade Chronicles. This game proved itself to me though, and has been one of, if not, the most surprising game I have ever played in terms of subverting my expectations for what the game would be. The story was absolutely incredible. I still enjoy the story of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 a bit more, but Xenoblade 2's felt more flushed out, and it's not by a lot that I preferred the original Xenoblade story. Before release, Rex struck me as a bit annoying, but through the story, he's actually a very fascinating character to watch develop. Going from feeling like gold by being the driver of the legendary Aegis, like he can take on the world, to being knocked down a peg and forced to humble himself on several occasions. The supporting cast is vibrant and felt way more charming than the cast of the original Xenoblade, Though the original did an incredible job with the cast in terms of both the characters with each other and with their roles in the story, and I found myself loving that cast. The antagonist characters are brilliantly written, having a hatred for the world that the game makes sure to take plenty of time to make believable, rather than players simply taking the game's word for it, and at times it makes sure to express just how much pain drove them to the lengths they've gone as the antagonist characters. It also made sure to clear up several mysteries of the first Xenoblade Chronicles, making the most perfect sequel I've ever had the pleasure of playing, telling its own story while making the story as a whole feel more complete, 
especially considering the holes the original Xenoblade had first presented. The gameplay was so incredibly refined for this game. Xenoblade 1 had entertaining enough gameplay, with plenty of depth, but nothing I'd be willing to invest the time into to go around in the postgame to hunt the super bosses or anything like that. Xenoblade Chronicles 2, however, just feels so clean, so satisfying to play well, and to customize your own experience with what blades you have, similar to Jobs in Bravely Default and Second, getting to tailor your own style of gameplay and apply your own strategies. More egg could be a tank, or you could be crazy and make her a tanky healer like I have. The game becomes a strategic playground. Certain aspects of the gameplay of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 felt semi-random, such as chain attacks and how long they got extended for. With Xenoblade Chronicles 2 having clear-cut rules for aspects such as chain attacks, allows you to strategize around them and start annihilating your enemies with use of game knowledge. Let me tell you, is an 8-orb chain attack ever the most satisfying thing? Where this game shines the most though is the soundtrack, as my favorite soundtrack of all time. This was the first case of a game I played where I genuinely loved every single piece of music in the entire soundtrack, a feat I never thought any game would ever achieve. This game has incredible music everywhere, and where there's no right for music to be so good. Like the menu for Merc missions, why is it so good? In addition, the soundtrack has brilliant use of reusing tunes, bringing a feeling like this is still the same story, but with a completely different tone. This is easily one of the most incredible games I've ever had the pleasure of playing, and is my game of the year for 2017. 2018 Pokemon Let's Go was a very interesting idea for our game, combining very high casual play to a main series Pokemon game of sorts. It made it accessible for anyone, and was the game that introduced Pokemon roaming around in the world, which would later be used in Sword and Shield, which added such a level of realness to the world. The remastered soundtrack was beautiful, and I enjoyed just how much of an emphasis it had on strings. And to top it off, Eevee was friggin' adorable. The games I praise on the highest level typically need to have an incredible story and music. Smash Ultimate doesn't exactly have much of a story, and you can't say a lot about the soundtrack considering it's mostly soundtrack from other games. Not a lot to call its own, though the few themes that it truly has to call its own are incredible to be fair. I usually don't consider a game a masterpiece or close to it off of gameplay almost completely alone, but the amount of heart and soul poured into it is staggering, and I haven't seen that much poured into a game since Planet Coaster. I feel like not enough people truly appreciate the notion of everyone is here, that they didn't want anybody to be disappointed that their favorite character from a previous Smash game didn't make it in. They even went so far as to change such little things to make people like me happy, like nerfing roles, the one thing I wished for the most when the game first got announced. Sure, I may not have everything and every character I wanted, no Waluigi or Xenoblade 2 character, but I won't let that blind me from what is there, a game packed with an incredible amount of love and passion. One game blew me away even more during 2018 though, which was none other than Octopath Traveler. Made by the creators of Bravely Default and Bravely Second, I had high expectations for this game and was still astounded. The unique art style was so full of charm. The surroundings were charming, and the realistic water, fire, and effects were beautiful, and combined with the soundtrack, made for one of the most gorgeous games I have ever played. The stories were relatively simple, something you may expect from a typical classic RPG that this game is clearly meant to be a modern version of. On their own, no stories were super exceptional, though Ophelia's was a very good one I'd argue, but the game also had deep lore that connected all eight stories in a fascinating way. The gameplay was breathtaking. This is the only turn-based RPG I have ever played where the random encounter battles are genuinely fun. 
Because of the enemy weaknesses and breaking system, every battle becomes a puzzle on how to most efficiently break and defeat your enemies. Taking inspiration from the braving system of the previous games, the boosting system made for in-depth gameplay that felt very satisfying to pull off correctly. Gameplay-wise, this is the best turn-based RPG I've ever played, and that's not even the best part. Where this game truly marks itself as a masterpiece in my mind is the soundtrack. I never thought I'd play a game where I thought every single piece of music in the OST was incredible, and now it's happened twice, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and Octopath Traveler. Words cannot do this soundtrack justice, it just so perfectly encompasses the world around you. The relaxing themes are perfectly atmospheric, and builds the world around you. Breath of the Wild wishes it could have a soundtrack like this. This is how to nail atmospheric music. Every piece of music just feels like it takes me on a journey all on its own. The battle themes stand out just as much as the world themes. Leading into a boss battle, it plays a loop of music over and over again, and once the boss actually starts, it breaks the loop to transition into the boss theme. Every character has their own version of the pre-battle that plays that always transitions perfectly into the boss theme. It just adds to how authentic the entire experience feels, and the boss battle themes themselves absolutely nail orchestral rock. This game easily deserves my Game of the Year for 2018. Starting off for 2019, while not the initial release of the original of this game, we have Mario & Luigi Bowser's Inside Story plus Bowser Jr's Journey. Bowser's Inside Story had always been my favorite Mario & Luigi game, and probably would have taken a personal Game of the Year from me in this video if it wasn't before 2010. It was pretty strange that a 3DS game would release in early 2019, nearly two years after the release of the Switch, and I was a bit disappointed that this seemed to mean one of my favorite games would never be remade on newer consoles. On playing it though, it becomes evident that the gameplay would have to change drastically to appear on a console like the Switch. Overall, this was still the Bowser's Inside Story that I had fallen in love with so many years before, with a genuinely enjoyable story and plenty of laughs along the way. It's a very unique experience to get to see Bowser as one of the heroes, and Fawful makes for one of my favorite villains. Rut row. Hey, this story with this crazy statue. It's going nuts. I have chortles. It is I who added the nuts to that statue. <laughs> Awful speak is literally like the best thing ever. The remastered soundtrack gave me nostalgia for the original, and I love the new take on the classic tunes. I just wish they'd remade the title theme instead of making a new one. I wasn't expecting a lot from Bowser Jr's journey, but wound up genuinely enjoying it a lot. It somehow made me actually care for Bowser Jr as a character, and was cram packed with laugh out loud moments. It was the perfect addition to the already great Bowser's Inside story, and overall, I had an awesome time with this game. Now, this game here got so much criticism before it came out, mostly spawning after the reveal that the National Dex was gone. People kept telling me up to the release of Pokemon Sword and Shield that the gameplay was toned back, that the music wasn't supposed to be as good as previous games, that there's less to do in the region, all that kind of stuff. On playing it though, this honestly became my second favorite main series Pokemon game, only outclassed by Black and White. Discovering new Pokemon is always fun, and I liked most of the new Generation 8 Pokemon introduced. Mega Evolutions and Z-Moves became a bit oversaturated using them every battle, 
but because Dynamax could only be used during main battles like gym battles, it felt hype every time you did it, and it didn't get stale because of how little you could use it. This is the most alive and authentic Pokemon game I've ever played. No more random encounters in tall grass or going through caves. The Pokemon actually exist in the world. Instead of some annoying random encounter as you walk through grass, now unintentional encounters are because you ran into one by accident, or the Pokemon straight up chased you down. Interacting with Pokemon in the camp is very charming, and the whole experience from this all together just feels so real. The characters with the three rivals were great, and the supporting cast were all colorful in their own way. The music was pretty good overall, though some themes felt like they hit the wrong area. Others though were incredible. The battle themes were such jammers, with my favorite being Marnie's theme. The final boss was the best in any main series Pokemon game, I'd argue. The scene combined with the music made it a perfect finale to the adventure. This was an absolute pleasure to play, but there's one game that hooked me more this past year. Similar to Hyrule Warriors, Fire Emblem Three Houses is jam-packed with content up the yin-yang. At the time of writing this, I've only completed two routes of Three Houses, Silver Snow and Azure Moon. It's because I'm a streamer, I only want to cover it when I can stream it, so no playing it in handheld mode or on my own time to experience what I'm blind to. If I wasn't a streamer, I can guarantee I'd be through all four routes by now. Even just 2 out of 4 playthroughs in, this is an insanely long game. Casual playthrough to learn the game on my first run was a 60 part series. Second playthrough, now understanding the game and taking the time to perfect my units, 105 part series. One playthrough was 105 parts. Just... wow. By the end of this, I know my series on the game will easily have to be over 300 parts, and there's so much content in this game that now at the halfway point, I've had to take a break for the past several months so that I can actually catch up on other games I've wanted to cover. This game has to be one of the most vibrant and charming casts I've seen in a Fire Emblem game, and made me love the characters. It had twists and turns I did not expect, and it was sad when it needed to be, it was silly when it needed to be, and it's just the perfect game for a console like the Switch to go into the world and just experience some more with your cast of students. I've been making Excel spreadsheets, planning out optimal builds for my units in Fire Emblem since Awakening. And the way that reclassing and obtaining skills works, plus the function of the classroom, it's like it was made for min-maxers like me. I had a blast helping all my students along towards becoming incredible behemoths I had planned out on spreadsheets and notepads weeks or even months earlier. The removal of skills like Astra, Luna, Soul made it so there was actually more strategy into what skills to equip on characters than just throw every skill with a skill stat percent chance of activating and hey presto you have an OP build. You can still make broken builds, but it takes more careful consideration, and let me tell you was I ever thrilled with my vantage plus wrath plus defiant crit strategy wound up giving my units a 100% chance to attack and crit every time, including on the final boss of Azure Moon. The gameplay does have some problems, my biggest being the developers did not consider carefully enough when they allow you to save, considering my save file of Azure Moon of my 105 part series where I spent countless hours developing the most broken builds is now soft locked because I saved right before the credits. So every time I load it up, it just plays the credits. Meaning all my hard work is now gone apart from buying unlocked progress with Renown through New Game Plus. The save file itself is now screwed. Let's get back to the positives. The world of the monastery was awesome. Being able to explore around in a Fire Emblem game was a breath of fresh air. The transition this game took to full voice acting, which had only been tried in Echoes previously, was spot on. The voice acting was so well done that every time I got to explore the monastery, I would make sure to talk to everyone, not miss any dialogue, and every exploration typically took an hour to an hour and a half every time. The music was incredible, one of the best games at reusing tunes I've ever seen. Reusing the main theme in so many different contexts, it was unreal. The music would pick up to unbelievably epic when it needed to for the grandest of battles, and it made me feel like there was so much on the line. I might technically only be halfway through this game with two playthroughs out of four, and with Azure Moon being my favorite of the two I played, this can still take my game of the year for 2019. Dimitri's story was an interesting one, and I enjoyed watching how his character developed. I enjoyed how the story took an approach to battling one's inner demons in the same way that Pokemon Super Mystery Dungeon did, arguing that they can't easily be conquered, and you can't just brush them away. They're a part of who you are, what have shaped you into who you are, and that's through acceptance of them that you can find the way to peace. Well, now that that's out of the way, 
Here are my games of the year for the past decade. In 2010, we have Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. 2011, Pokemon Black and White. 2012, we have a change of pace with Xenoblade Chronicles. 2013, something again very different with Assassin's Creed 4. 2014, we have Bravely Default. 2015 is Pokemon Super Mystery Dungeon. 2016, we have the sequel to Default in the form of Bravely Second. 2017, we have Xenoblade Chronicles 2. 2018 was Octopath Traveler, and then finally in 2019 was Fire Emblem Three Houses. There can only be one game of the decade though, and for me personally, the game that has impacted me the most over the past 10 years has been... Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Honestly, I would group up Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2 together in this slot, if that's allowed. <laughs> I guess it's my own list. Through Xenoblade 1 and 2, I've never had games draw me into their stories on such a deep level before, to take me on a journey that defied all expectations and assumptions along the way, but to still be coherent and form well together. I've gotten to watch characters develop in ways I hadn't considered from storytelling at all, and to do it all through such dark themes along the way that it was absolutely astounding. I felt connected to the characters, and genuinely cared for them along the way. The villains are some of the greatest I've ever seen, and you can understand what drove them to be the way they are, creating some of the most humanized villains I've ever seen. The music draws you in and takes you on an emotional roller coaster along with the characters experiencing them, and delivers one of the most incredible experiences. If I had to choose one, it would be Xenoblade Chronicles 2. At the end of the day, I do slightly prefer the story of Xenoblade 1, but Xenoblade 2 has a soundtrack that goes leaps and bounds above the standards of the first, becoming the first game I'd ever played to have a soundtrack where every track was incredible. It had me rethink my views on the standards for a soundtrack as a whole, and had music that shook me to my core when it needed to. In addition, it presented one of the most beautiful worlds I've ever seen, which combined with the soundtrack created such a breathtaking experience. The Expansion Pass DLC has been one of the most worthwhile DLCs I've ever seen for a game, delivering everything it promised and so much more along the way. Adding surprise new blades, some of which you didn't even need to own the Expansion Pass to obtain, several new quests and items to help make grinding so much easier, and a new game mode and challenge mode which is incredibly fun, and the best new game plus out of any game I've ever played. New Game Plus allows you to augment the difficulty to any custom way you want, making your own experience, in addition to new blades and the previously mentioned challenge mode. And at the end, the inclusion of the prequel story, Torna the Golden Country. The soundtrack of Xenoblade 2 was already incredible, so getting another short prequel game to add even more to that library of music was astounding, adding remixes of previous themes, and several completely new themes, with the best I'd argue being the theme for Oresco. The prequel also served to explain several parts of Xenoblade 2, having some of the last mystery pieces click together. Overall, the experience of Xenoblade Chronicles 1, 2, and Torna has been one of the greatest not just gaming experiences I've had, but one of the best storytelling and musical experiences as well. If I had to narrow it down to one game, Xenoblade 2 gets the credit, but if I can group things together, I'd crown the experience that is Xenoblade Chronicles 1, 2, Torna as my game of the decade. Well, that wraps up my discussion on the game of the decade for me personally. I have been talking for over an hour now, and it looks like I didn't write the final part of my script, so this is going <laughs> unscripted. So, yeah, let me know what you thought of my games of the year. If you disagree with it, if you agree with it, of course there's going to be disagreements for something like this that always happens when you post an opinion on the internet. But yeah, let me know what you think. Anyway, it's currently 4am in the morning. I'm going to go get some sleep. So, thank you so much for watching the video. I appreciate it as always, and until next time, see ya.